Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevan Zwelder. People often inquire about the will of God for their lives. Well, in several texts in the Bible, you can find the will of God clearly and unmistakably. Such is the case with our text today. The will of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, is right there in black and white, where you couldn't possibly miss it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For this is the will of God. You see that? This is the will of God. It's right there. What is it? Even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. You see, the will of God is that ye should abstain from fornication. It can't be put any plainer than that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to preach the will of God. And our hope is that when you see it, you will do exactly what the Lord says. Now, in order to help you abstain from fornication, we will thoroughly cover this subject by answering three questions. What is abstaining from fornication? How do you abstain from fornication? And why must you abstain from fornication? So we're going to cover those three things. In case you're wanting to know the answer why, you'll get that answer today. But we're going to start, first of all, to make sure that you understand what that will of God really is. What is abstaining from fornication? Now, according to the Bible, abstaining from fornication is abstaining from flesh joining flesh. Let's look at a larger text. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 13. The Bible says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats but God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? When you're saved, you're baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, and you become a member of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones, according to Ephesians chapter 5. So he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. I don't know if you got that, but when a man joins his body, even to a harlot, they become one flesh. There is a union there. But the Bible goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. What's the conclusion? Verse 18, flee fornication, period. <laughs> That's what 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says. First two words are a sentence. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So abstaining from fornication is abstaining from flesh joining flesh. He said the body is not for fornication. It is not for creating one flesh out of two by joining your body together with someone 
to whom you're not married. Now, when you are married, you become one flesh, and that union pictures the union of Jesus Christ and the church. Let me show it to you in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 30. The Bible says we are members of his, bo of his body. So see, when fornication is committed and you're joined to the Lord by one spirit and you take that temple of the Holy Ghost and join with somebody else, now what you've done is you have sinned against your own body. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So in marriage, when you become one flesh, your union pictures the union of Jesus Christ and the church, according to Ephesians 5.32. That's why marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. I'm quoting Hebrews. I'm quoting Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. You see that? And, and that marriage is undefiled because you're in Christ, and the union pictures Christ in the church. And so it's blessed. That's the beauty of what God gives us in the privilege of marriage you know, we oftentimes, as we are today, speaking against fornication, we oftentimes put that, uh, that benefit of marriage in a bad light. It's not, a, it's not that way at all. It's very beautiful and something that pictures the union of Christ and the church. Now, fornication is committed when your flesh joins with someone to whom you are not married, whether you are married or not. Some people have said, well, fornication is if you're not married and, and adultery is if you are married. Well, adultery is both the act and the thought. Fornication is the act whether you're married or not. I'll give you a couple of scriptures on that. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus Christ here has been asked about divorce. And he says in verse 9, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, committeth adultery. Well, in the case of fornication, he, he can put her away. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. So here is a married person, a married woman, who commits fornication. So you can commit that when you're married. Or you can commit it even if you're not. In John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, in verse 41... There is a discussion going on in this context between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. And they're arguing with him, as they always do, about who he is and who they are and how they follow Moses and all that other kind of stuff. Well, and how they're Abraham's children and all that. Now watch what they say in John chapter 8, verse 41. They say, you do the deeds of your father. He, that's what he said. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. All right, now what they're saying there is that Jesus Christ is the son of Mary and that he was born out of wedlock. In other words, that there was fornication between Mary and Joseph because they came together before their marriage. So, so it doesn't make any difference whether you're married or you're not married. When your flesh joins with someone to whom you are not married, okay, there's fornication. That's what it is. So abstaining from fornication is to abstain from that flesh joining flesh to someone with whom you're not married. The second question is, how do you abstain? How do you abstain from fornication? Well, the simplest way to abstain from fornication is to do exactly what the will of God says to do. Abstain. You know, it's, it's a shame that school thinks, public school thinks, that anything that God said from the Bible that was good is the establishment of a religion. And they just hate God's word so much as a general rule. I don't mean all the public school teachers and I don't mean all the public school students. I'm talking about in general, in the courts, in our society. You may love the Bible, and you may be in public school, and God bless you if you do. But let me say this. Abstinence is not really the thing they want to teach, okay? 
<laughs> and abstinence is the key. He said this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's how you abstain. You just do it. Just don't commit fornication. But look, the Bible also goes on to say that you need to know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. In other words, Paul assumes that it's going to be difficult under certain circumstances, so and so he, he doesn't leave you without good scriptural counsel. Look what he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 in our context, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Well, if you try out for the football team and the guy says, okay, I want you to be the right tackle, now block according to these plays until you know how you're not going to be competent, even though you may be very strong and you may be very big and you might be very fast. They have to teach you. And so it is with fornication. The, the Lord says, let me, let, let me show you let me show you how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. All right, first of all, he says this. First of all, he says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25, that you are not to lust after her beauty in your heart. Okay, that's addressed to a man. But by implication, we can also take instruction for the woman. Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 25. Let me read the passage to you so you get it. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with thine eyelids, or with her eyelids. All right, well, then what that shows you is you, you have to control your heart, and she must modestly present her beauty. Because her eyelids and her beauty can stir up the lust in you. So it, there's a two-way street here. You have to control your heart to keep from being drawn to her beauty. And she has to present her beauty in a modest fashion to keep you from being drawn. I mean, to the point of lust. Obviously, when couples come together, there generally is a physical attraction that accompanies the Lord's will and the spiritual attraction and all those other things. But not to the point that they can't contain themselves, you see. Second thing is that Proverbs chapter 6, verse 24 tells you to keep from the flattery of her tongue. Proverbs 6, 24 says to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. So what you need to do is you need to quit conversing with her when, when her speech is drawing you into this sin, and she needs to quit seducing you and quit teasing you with her voice so that you'll be attracted to her. Do you understand? Here's the third thing. So first of all, you're to control your heart. She's to modestly present her beauty. Secondly, you need to watch the conversation. You can't converse with her if what she's saying is drawing you to the sin and if she's trying to draw you to the sin. She needs to quit that. Matthew 5.28 shows you something else. Matthew 5.28 talks about adultery, but in this sense, if it leads you into the act, okay, then, it's, then it is something definitely to address in defending against or abstaining from fornication. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. All right, so Matthew 5, 28 shows you this. You need to control your eyes. That's right. There is a great display of flesh these days, and that display of flesh is intended to catch your eye. That's why it's used that way. Typically, when women are exploited, I say, exploited in advertising, many times, many times, their presence has absolutely nothing to do with the product that is being sold except to attract your eye, to catch your attention. And Matthew 5, 28 shows you, you that you need to control your eyes. And she, the one that you're looking at, needs to quit trying to catch your eye. Notice what Matthew 5, 28 says again, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery, watch it, with her already in his heart. In other words, she's complicit. She's an accomplice. It was her intention 
to attract attention. And so when she succeeds and what he sees stimulates his lust, he's committing adultery with her because it was her intention for him to look. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, gives you yet another instruction. You see, there's all kind of counsel to protect you, to help you fulfill the will of God in your life, to abstain from fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says this. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, Paul says this, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. It shows you that you are not to touch her because that is more than most folks can handle. It shows you that doing, listen, listen. When you look at this right here, look. It is good for a man not to, watch it, touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. You see that thing? In the very context, Paul understands the touch can lead to fornication. Now, now, think about what you're reading here. Because there is an awful lot of activity going on today that doesn't involve full-fledged fornication that is being used, okay, and it shows you that doing other things physically while avoiding joining flesh with flesh is still wrong. Still wrong. See, people are always trying to find the edge. They always want to say, well, God says this and, and I want to do this. And let me see how close I can get to what I want to do and still somehow convince myself that I'm doing what God wants me to do. No, the will of God is very clear. And he says, he says let me tell you something. Don't think about her. Don't look at her. Don't lust after her. Okay? Don't talk to her. Don't even touch her. You see what God's doing here? He is driving you away from the line of uncertainty. <laughs> He's saying, I know how you think. You're thinking, how close can I get to this line and still not cross it? And God says, get as far away from that line as you possibly can. I'll show it to you. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 8. <laughs> I know you think I'm kidding, and I'm not. Neither is the Bible. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, remove thy way, next word, far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Don't even get close. You see that? Proverbs 5, 8 shows you that you are to remove your way far from the woman to whom you're drawn by lust. Get away. Stay away. Don't get close to the line. You say, well, but I want, I know, I know, God knows. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> we all know. Listen, Paul told Timothy, Timothy was a precious soul to him. He called him his son in the ministry. And look what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. He, he, just, he just lays it on the line for him. He says, Timothy, you want to fulfill the will of God in your life? Do this. Flee also youthful lust. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Can you remember that? 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 2 Timothy 22. Flee also youthful lusts. When the thing just starts up, he said, just hit the road. Run. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where we read, you know, that was the second text that we took today. We had that long passage there about fornication and flesh joining flesh. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. He says, flee fornication. Just like Do Joseph did when Potiphar's wife was coming after him. He just fled. He just fled. So how do you abstain from fornication? You must control your thought life, your heart, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and your vessel. And you are to run like the wind to abstain from fornication. That's what you're to do. It's a strange thing how Christians are so uncertain about the will of God. And then when you see it so clearly as this, now all of a sudden you're like, well, pff, I don't want to do that. But that's what you have to do. It is the will of God. 
So that brings us to the next question, the third question. Why must you abstain from fornication? Why? Now, I'm well aware that there are numerous Christians today who see absolutely nothing wrong with fornication as long as it does not involve someone who is married. Oh, they think it's fine. You, you're kind of loving each other. You just want to try things out, check things out before the marriage. And so you, you start that activity. And they said, there's nothing wrong with it. The Bible says there is. Back there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when we started, about the will of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 5 says, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, concupiscence is just, it's, it's unbridled lust, okay? Just goes after anything. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, 5 says, not in the love of concupiscence, watch it, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Well, here's what I'm going to say. If you believe that it's okay, that is, fornication is okay, particularly, you know, in the instance where you're hoping to be married one of these days and that kind of thing, that you are dead wrong. You hold a godless opinion. Just like the Gentiles, which know not God, but you agnostics who believe that fornication is okay. And you say, well, it's okay. Look, they all do it. And God says, that's, that's what people who don't know me do and believe. But you know me. Listen, they may believe the Gentiles, which know not God, may believe that fornication is okay, but not God's children. So you should abstain from fornication because it's ungodly. But that's not all. You ought to abstain from fornication because God will judge you. That's right. You are going to face God with what you are doing or what you're thinking about doing and giving an account. Look what he says. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. We read the first part earlier. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And he's going to judge you. He's going to judge you. You say, well, how is it going to turn out in my judgment? Not well. Not well at all. You say, well, can you give me any indication? Sure, I can. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Here's, what the, here's how the judgment is going to turn out. You know, with God, you don't, have to worry about, you don't have to worry about whether you're going to pass the final exam. God shows you how he's going to grade according to his word. You reject Jesus Christ, you wind up in hell. You know that. All right? You get saved and you fornicate, you, something bad's going to happen. And here it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, watch it, shall inherit the kingdom of God. What happens when you don't abstain from fornication? God will judge you, and, and, and you know what he'll do at the judgment? You'll lose your eternal inheritance. That's what he said. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 10, these in the list shall, and none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, your eternal inheritance will be forfeited for fornication. And, and, and just notice something. There's a lot of things in this list. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Fornicators are first on the list. Did you see that? I'll give you a practical reason to abstain from fornication. It's Proverbs chapter 5, verse 11. Just a practical reason. Proverbs 5, 11 shows you the practical reason for abstaining from fornication is it's unhealthy. <laughs> he, he's in the middle of a context here, but he says, And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. 
You know, it's funny. People talk about safe sex today. Do you understand that God never intended for it to be dangerous? When you have to talk that way. You're doing something that God didn't intend, and you're doing something that's wrong. And here's another reason why you need to abstain from fornication, because like all sin, once you start it, it is impossible for you to stop it on your own. Romans chapter 8, verse 13 says that ye through the Spirit must uh, mortify the deeds of the flesh. And here's what's going to happen. You start out like that, go into marriage, and you will eventually carry that fornication right into your marriage, and you will destroy your home. That's right. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 says, Lust, with, lust when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And I'm telling you, it is a it is a marriage killer. A marriage killer. I've seen many of them destroyed by fornication. Well, let's conclude like this. If you're contemplating fornication, forget it. Run away from it. Don't even think about it. If you're involved in fornication right now, quit it. You are disobeying the plain will of God. And don't think for a moment that God will give you anything else from his word to help you until you get back in his will. Your spiritual growth is stunted right now. And I don't care how much you go to church, how much you want to try to peruse through the Bible, you're not going to grow. And you will not grow until you abstain from fornication and get back into the will of God. That's all there is to it. Now, you can't get any plainer than what you've heard today. And, and we surely didn't have to get graphic. We didn't have to defile you with the subject matter. We just gave you the plain truth. Walk in the truth of God's words and do the will of God. Abstain from fornication. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible, the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361-241-6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible-believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Hallelujah.